Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. This week it's all about the Orville. They're going to be shooting Season 3 in just a couple of weeks' time. And uh, But I want you to learn all about it, but I don't want you to learn it from us. We're going to give it to you firsthand as we have a Zoom meeting with the Orville backstage. Stick around. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here, cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to the show, everybody. Before we jump into it, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and also click on that bell so that you get notifications every time we post a new and shiny video. Now, I want to give you a heads up. If you haven't seen the first two seasons of The Orville, there may be spoilers this week. Right. There well, may we're just gonna have to deal be with spoilers. <laughs> However, if you've watched the first two seasons of The Orville, please help me to welcome The Orville's editor and associate producer, Tom Costantino, along with visual effects producer, Brooke Noska. Welcome to the show, you two. Hi. Co-producer. <laughs> <laughs> Can you... Bumps. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, more responsibility. Well, and Less pay. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, story and Brooke's of your a co-visual effects supervisor, too, because she's in everything. So, so this brings me, like, things are changing right now with the show because you're just about to begin filming season three. So maybe uh, for myself, just to kind of re refresh where things are at as far as your positions go, can you introduce yourselves uh, individually and what it is that you do as at the Orville. So not, I'm not talking job. I'm not talking just job titles. I want to know, like, what do you actually do behind the scenes? Sure. Yeah. Um, so as the VFX producer on the show, um, I'm kind of the cat wrangler. Um, you know, that's a professional term of it. And you know, basically, the visual effects is such an in, like inclusive department. We're part of pre-production. We're part of production. We're part of post-production and getting it out the door. Um, so we're kind of the only department that has our hands, fingers, and toes in every single part of it, mm -hmm. um, coupled up with the editorial and post department. Um, so because we're such a huge show, we're set in space. Spoiler, we don't shoot there. Um, we have to make sure that everybody is all on the same page on what we need to shoot, what it needs to look like, smell like, feel like, um, and that that carries all the way from start to finish. Um, and so I get to make sure that it looks like that, it feels like that, and it costs like that. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Definitely costly. Like yeah. Um, and then as the co-supervisor um, with Brandon Fayette and our uh, other new co-supervisor, Eric Hayden, um, I kind of just help make sure that everything that is included in this season is also being achieved creatively um, so that we can kind of take a little bit off of their plate so that Brandon can focus on the previs, he can focus yeah. on set. Um, Brandon, or Eric can focus on set and with our internal team and that I can focus more in making sure that everything's prepped for Seth with those guys' help and getting it out the door. And you guys get a super awesome, awesome show. <laughs> yeah. And Tom, yourself? Uh, yeah, well, I uh, started as an editor on the pilot. I've been here. I'm, I'm old school. I've been here since day one. So um, my role now is that I am a, I'm a supervising editor and co-producer. So I'm going to have three editors and three assistants under me. Uh, I'm in charge of all picture editorial, uh, making sure, you know, I'll still have my hands in stuff, cutting picture, uh, making sure things go well with second units. Um, my co-producer stuff encompasses a lot of things. It helps out with marketing. I'm usually in charge of Comic-Con uh, and various other things that we need around here. There's just a lot to do. It's a big, big show. So I'm sort of like the catch-all, and I hope I happen to be the uh, resident fanboy of Star Trek and all things Star Trek and, uh, you know, and sci-fi in general. So I'm sort of the go-to for, for the inside track on that. So that's, yeah. that's me in a nutshell. But. And working behind the scenes at such a big show as the Orville, like what is 
the workload like? Are you guys like, do you get enough downtime that you're keeping your sanity? Is it, uh, is it like, what does it feel like to be working at the Orville? I mean, I think we are kind of a, a basket of characters and we yeah. thrive on insanity. Sure. That's right. what fuels us, it's what fuels our passion. It's just being insane all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we we know what it's like to be on a show like this, especially since we've done it for the last two seasons. So, um, you know, stepping it up even another notch in season three, we're, we're ready for it. We're juiced. And that's kind of why we signed on because yeah. we can't get enough. <laughs> yeah. It's an ambi- it's an ambitious show. So if you're looking for a nine to five job, this is the place for you. And we're OK with that. I mean, it takes a lot to put people, for lack of a better word, in space doing epic things. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody's here because they want to be here. So, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a labor of love. And there's not a lot of shows like us out there. Um, so when you finally do get on one uh, that people actually like, it's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> kind of want to stick around. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to get into the tech because Category 5 Technology TV is a tech broadcast. And so I want to kind of, you know, ha- have that discussion. And, and one of the things... Like we we think about way back in the day, and I think you know uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation. I'm a big fanboy, Tom. Um, and so back then, as a fan of Star Trek, there was no social media. There was no capability for me as a fan to uh, to even let the producers of the show know that that I was loving what they were doing. Um, Technology has changed a lot since then. So, how has kind of the advent of uh, of social media, in particular, uh, how has that made it um, different for you as as producers of the show? Uh, just being able to communicate with your fans. Well, uh, you know, having that kind of interactivity, uh, it's ninety eight percent a blessing. It's two percent a curse. Yeah. Um, we get r- almost real time feedback about how people feel about the show. Right. Also. Uh, so that's kind of an amazing thing. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There were probably a couple things that we tweaked last year based on some information we got. You know, if it's like the general trend from posts or about something, we'll occasionally look at that ourselves and mm. uh, maybe change part of the script or reshoot something small. I mean, we don't we wow. don't see change scripts and things, but are it's, are it's, you able to are you able to come up with an example of such a scenario? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, uh, for telling tales out of school, um, the AV Club who is very, they've, they've become real fans of ours, and we love their reading. They they made an offhanded comment about the Kalon outfits. And, you know, uh, next thing you know, we were, we were you know, amping up some battle stuff. Um, <laughs> even though they meant it as a compliment, it's like, you know, all right, all right, we see, it's a little kitschy, we can fix that. We can make them more horrifying. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so some stuff for 13, for 213, the uh, finale, we, uh, we, we, we did some pickups. I mean, that's that's the short of it. But it's it's more just like a generalized sense of, oh, OK, this is how the fans are feeling. This is what they appreciate yeah. about us. Um, you know, we we are here for them. Uh, so, you know, we would like to you know, we like to like know what they are thinking. And it feels uh, from a fan perspective, it really feels like the evolution of of being able to be entertained because we're interacting with the very creators of the show. So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, I mean, kind of change we're doing it in right paradigm. Now. Yeah, we're absolutely. Met, we met online, so exactly. So um, so thinking of the social media piece. Um, is there any particular type of interaction that uh, that you behind the scenes or even the cast and, and the crew of the show that, that you really love to receive? Uh, I love to, God, you want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, I, we've kind of mentioned it before about how, like, once again, we're, we're so excited about the work that we finally get to, like, release to you guys. Yeah. Um, so it was always exciting when we would turn it on, when it was on, you know, Thursday nights, we'd turn it on and we would all be, we'd be more glued to the Twitter live feed (laughs) and how like, oh my God, did you just see that? Or it's like, oh man, is Boris going to sing? No, like it's, we're like, we're feeling it with you guys because we've watched it. We've watched it without any visual effects. We've watched it with visual effects. We've watched it without color, with score, without, like we've seen it probably a hundred times by the time you guys have seen it. Yeah. So in order to get that like one more fresh eye yeah. and somebody will, I mean, we do a really, really good job to make sure we don't leave any coffee cups in there, but uh, <laughs> we <laughs> but we really like to A, make sure that what we've been seeing and enjoying and pitching and you know, seeing through is exactly what everybody else is excited about and having the reactions that we're intending to have. 
Um, so yeah, it's really awesome to get that live that live feedback from the fans, whether it be good, bad, ugly, or otherwise. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been really yeah, it's yeah, been no, really exciting. It's literally, I mean, usually, look, in fairness, we're working. You know, we don't we 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 go to the wire sometimes just because of the massiveness amount of the show. So yeah. it's fifteen of us out right outside here. Scrolling through our phones, yeah. trying to see what people are saying. It's not yeah. sexy like theater. no, no, it's, it's not like, sexy. It's, we it's, all have laptops. We're like, okay, yeah, and then we follow. On. And then it's always interesting to see something that we glossed over or didn't think would play that they someone loves, or it's like something we thought would be like the biggest point. You know, the biggest oh. plot point just glows like right past. Us. We spent days yeah. working on. It. Like, so do you, you? You gotta like you gotta stop yourself from being like, guys. Did you notice that particular yeah. thing? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I mean, there was one. There's one thing I kind of like. I snuck in there was uh, during the episode when they find the iPhone. Uh, it did, we never like got a time on like what time it was supposed to be. So I was like, make it one forty three. That'll be my I love you to the audience. And nobody <laughs> was like, oh my god, it's time one forty three. I was like. <laughs> Boom, there it is. I stuck that in. I love you guys. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. People didn't... And Nobody got it. Now, now everybody's... <laughs> you realize everybody's going to be looking for it now, so... But, but the, the great I love thing... you guys, too. <laughs> the great thing is, is that there's a recurring cast of, of, of internet characters that, that we... I mean, it's it's pretty vast, but, you know, there's probably 500 or 1,000 uh, recurring super fans, maybe even more, that, that we all try to interact with, and yeah. they all have their own personalities, their own interests, and that 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 is probably the best part of the job because whenever I'm not feeling so great about the gig, <laughs> one of them will pep me up. <laughs> oh, good, good man. Uh, and you guys, you're you're all doing such a wonderful job. And, and as uh, a viewer of the show, uh, you know we we've just been loving all of the work that you've been doing. Um, we'll talk we'll talk a little bit more about uh, about the fandom piece in just a couple of moments' time. But uh, I want to touch on the technology that you're actually using in the set area of the show. So um, how has, uh, for example, robotics or digital technology uh, really changed the production process and kind of the behind the scenes for a production like the Orville? Um, well, for for us in post, we, we do a lot of work with Shotgun um, so that we can track, you know, we produced over 7,000 shots last season mm -hmm. um, that you guys saw, but there was 22,000 versions that went through the pipeline. Wow. That's like the biggest television show I've yeah. ever heard So how, how, many, how many cameras are you simul <laughs> simultaneously shooting with? Uh, we're shooting, I mean, we'll shoot with the standard, you know, three, three maybe four, four yeah. maybe a drone unit, maybe a special, you know, technocrane situation. Mm -hmm. um, but in order to get all the data that we need, you know, from those cameras, the metadata, the camera data, you know, the measurements and all that, that's all been more or less digital, digitized, um, which, you know, even just helps the throughput of what we need from the set. Yeah. Um, and just having, you know, Again, just having access to, you know, uh, we all have iPhones, so we use, we share notes of like, hey, by the way, we shot off set this day. Hey, I got it. We'll let people know. Um, or, you know, if I'm in Mammoth and Brandon's here in LA and, you know, somebody else is at home sick, like we can all still progress the day without missing a beat because honestly, television has no time for the weary sick right. or tired. <laughs> well, you know, something else that's something that like, even like five years ago was, was like a huge pain, but you no, know, we did an episode last year where there were two Adrians, there were two Kellys, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. We had to do some compositing. Oh, you know, astonishing job. Yeah, but we're not, we're not a, look, we're not a Marvel movie and some of this stuff is, uh, you know, we have to do some old fashioned trickery, but literally, literally we, uh, I, I was, I took my Abbott over there. We plugged, we plugged uh, our, our hard drive into the, the video feedback, the, the, the video tap for lack of a better word. I pulled out some quick times and I was cutting on set to make sure stuff was actually working in real time. Mm. Uh, and then also Brandon too, to double check his compositing was also doing the same thing and literally compositing on set on a laptop. So we could get some real time feedback. It's a wow. little jerry rig, but it's like trying to do that five years ago would have been impossible. Yeah, and it really brings me to the digital point. Like, digital has completely revolutionized the process. Uh, from a post-production standpoint, you mentioned if people are off sick and everything, you're able to still collaborate through phones and everything. Are you using any kind of um, telepresence in order to be able to do remote editing and things like that? Um, not, not specifically, like, remote editing. Um, it's more, you know, we'll use the given, you know, file sharing systems. Okay. But... 
you know, I mean, even just like trying to send something to Seth, like we sent, we, we get it together. We send it to him to his phone so that he can have it in his hand and oh, he needs cool. to use it yeah. on set for something like, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that what he's using, what he's seeing is accessible to him also. Um, so I, I don't know. It's, <laughs> well, we did it. We did a little bit of work with, you know, the system Evercast. Yeah, it's, um, a, it's a it's a remote editing system. Um, the thing is, is that because and I say this with love and with with ultimate admiration, Seth is so fast. He literally sees fields. I've said this before. He can hear fields and see fields because of his animation background. And yeah. also he's a freaking genius that the that the Evercast system had a delay. So we could only use it for more macro based stuff. Oh, but wow. He, you know, so we actually had to do stuff in the room. But we could edit from thousands of miles away using the, the Evercast system with my Avid basically up on somebody's phone. Wow, incredible. Same thing with <laughs> Skype too. We can do, we share screens with and Skype. Did, and we did the same thing for, you know, the scoring sessions. Yeah. You know, we would, if somebody, right. if somebody was able Symphony? to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but we did have a setup where, you know, if a director or somebody wasn't able to make it, they would be able to, you know, tap into the system, yeah. be there and talk back to the, you know, the composer talk back to everybody that needs to be involved. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have definitely tested a lot of things yeah. <laughs> uh, because we are moving at such a breakneck speed. Yeah. Um, but it's also been such like a crazy adventure to be able to say, hey, we can do this. Like right. features are doing it. Why can't we Why can't basically we do features? It? Like, come on. I mean, we're basically <laughs> doing an 11 hour feature this year. And look, in fairness is, you know, the scoring stage, you can't see where I'm pointing, but it's, the lot, the Fox lot is big. It's not the biggest lot, but you know that that's six minutes from getting the scoring stage back to stage fifteen. Yeah. You do that four times in a day, you've lost a half hour. A half hour times every week is mm. is a, a quanti a quantitative a large a large amount of time. So <laughs> everything adds up. And as we're gearing up for season three, I do want to hear more about the turnaround process. We do have to take a really quick break, though. We're speaking with Tom Costantino, as well as Brooke Noska. They are from the Orville. And when we get back, uh, just looking at my notes, what we want to cover, uh, we're going to talk about how real-world tech is actually impacting the production of the Orville and the actual uh, on-air stuff. As well, uh, we're going to learn more about season three of the Orville and how you can win the actual jar of pickles from the Orville set. Stick oh, thank around. Thank you. Thank you for the Twitter feed uh, <laughs> post. <laughs> Downtown San Diego. Bill 
Season 3 in 2020 on Hulu. Boom. All right, you can win the actual jar of pickles from the set of season two's episode, Home of the Orville. Uh, it's been personally autographed by the show's executive producer, director, John Kassar, and uh, you can find out how you can get that, how you can participate in that contest. We've got a hot link for you, cat5.tv. Oh, look at what he's got. Can you there it is. Oh, we can yeah. see you now. Yeah, cat5. I've got it, cat5.tv slash Pickles, I and that will pickles. take you. That can, will take can you. Can I enter? Yeah. So are oh, putting it back on the shelf. <laughs> are they or are they I'm not? Again. Sorry, everybody. So are they real pickles or are they props? They are unfortunately real pickles. And while I have a captive audience, please don't eat them and then sue us. <laughs> <laughs> not an official contest. This is not. They've been sitting in there for a year. <laughs> Um, if you haven't seen the episode yet, season two's home, make sure you check it out and, uh, and participate in that contest, cat5.tv slash pickles. The contest is open until Saturday the 12th and including that date. Is there any interesting tech, Tom or Brooke, that you've seen kicking around the, the set that, uh, that is perhaps consumer gear or stuff that, uh, that, that makers are interested in i think about like do you ever use arduinos or do you know anything about what's being used there on the set um i mean honestly uh iphones have really come That's out it. with a ton of awesome features uh, even like the latest you know they have a basically a quad split feature um so we do a lot we'll do a lot of pre -vis. we'll we'll actually just take our phones and we'll just you know stage out something We'll edit it together in like an iMovie on our phones, send it, and you know that's how we kind of do a little bit of visualization of pre-production. But yeah, I mean, I think the most handy consumer product is if you have a phone and it's a smartphone, you can it, make it, anything. You can make anything. <laughs> I mean, look, even in fairness, some of our door panels are actually I, they're, they're 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 iPad minis oh, that yeah? we actually interact with live. It's oh. a little program that lights up. Now sometimes we'll enhance with VFX, but. We have been known to sneak an, I, an iPad or an iPad mini or a phone into a prop and let it just do its thing with some graphics. So. I'd love to see that added to the App Store. That would be fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm sure we can, we can work that out for you. <laughs> um, now, this, this being your job, I mean, it's really, really easy for us going to work every day, and you guys work long hours, um, to look at the, the stuff that comes in, that's, uh, and we're thinking again about the tech, that is really exceptional, but it, it's easy to just kind of oh it's old hat because you deal with it every single day but is there anything that through the course of the first two seasons of the show or even now as you're gearing up to shoot season three is there any gear that has just made you go like wow like this is mind-bending that i am a part of this because of this technology no saying iphone <laughs> no, no, no. um i mean we have we have some secret stuff in production that we can't wait to show you and tell yeah. you guys about um but i mean yeah i think it's just it's really just, you know, all the different apps and tools that you can use on an Apple product is like unbelievable. Um, she went there. Other than that, <laughs> we, we have some pretty we, cool we, cameras. Yeah, <laughs> yes. we, do, we do. We do. We do have. We do. I mean, I'm not going to not going to say, but there there is a revolutionary uh, proprietary thing mm -hmm. that's going to help uh, us. Um, you know, invented by people here, uh, hopefully patented. I believe it's patented. Working on a patent that that's gonna that's gonna revolutionize how we shoot some of the more complex scenes. I don't want to say anything more about it, literally okay. NDA bending, but there, you know, if we do this again in a year, yeah, um, we'll bring on we'll bring on the, those people and let them talk about it. But it, but because we're we're moving so fast, to have the ability to sort of, for lack of a better word, live, 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 you know, just be able to do things more organically mm -hmm. is is uh, pretty pretty wild. But um. You know, we use drones for all the time for a lot of our, our you know, I, we haven't shot a single uh, wide, wide master shot that hasn't been used with a drone. Um, I'm trying to think what other toys we, we have. I mean, a lot, a, lot, a lot of our, see, we're different. Is a lot of our toys come from Brooks Magic. So it's, you know, we have a huge set over there that, of course, is also right now all NDA because of what's going on. But, yeah. but a lot of our sets are, are large and, and real. So... You know, we're we're kind of old school Hollywood in some of that in that way. Yeah, uh, the foo in the chat is wondering if you have anything that uses Linux uh, that helps you with your production chain. Linux? 
Can we do Linux? Uh, it sounds familiar, but <laughs> I am not a Linux expert. So. That's cool. No. So that's, that's a question. <laughs> hey, think about the fact that our community would love to know that. So if you ever hear about that, then just know, hey, ping Robbie at Category 5, because we'd love to let our viewers know. Okay. Um, no, I mean, we're mostly, I mean, we're pretty much Mac based here. Yeah. 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 We're Mac, Mac, Mac. I'm not that I'm not, I, I don't get a check for saying Mac, but we are, we're a Mac, we're a Mac family. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, this uh, logo running behind me is running off my Avid off of a Mac Avid. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's how we go. Yeah, it's good to good to have everything kind of all interconnected as well. Um, yeah. Thinking back to how things were shot 20 years ago, and thinking about how um, models were used in particular. Yes. Are, are you folks still using models, even though Brooke and her team are like doing some incredible stuff with VFX? Um, I, you know, it's. It's always, you know, it's kind of like the the, the homage, the, the homage, 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 homage ah, you know, it's potato, French potato, for cheese. tomato, purple. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we did, we shot the model the first season. Um, and then as we have grown, we've kind of, you know, put a couple extra scrapes and dents into that sexy model. Mm. Um, but we didn't want to put it into the actual model. So we've taken those uh, mocap that mocap information and we've updated the actual model so that it blends in with that season so it's not like oh wait this is from that season but we just you know mm. couldn't we, we loved it so much we didn't want to replace the ship so we still use the technique as if it was model shooting but it is a lot of digital right and you're talking mocap aka motion capture so you're bringing yeah. an actual physical model into a virtual world is that the idea yes Yes, yes. So the the whole paradigm of how to shoot these has been flipped on its head. Yeah, like I, I remember the old, much. old cranes, <laughs> the old cranes that had to go into it. So how are you shooting it? Like, are are you putting it on a stage and just taking shots, or? Yeah, they they did that for the first season. They you know they did all kinds of up downs through over um, through the model, and then we put that data into you know our nuke scripts or anything and tracked on and put, you know, the stars in the background or whatever planets and stuff, mm -hmm. um, just so that it had that real camera feel so that you felt like, you know, that camera is in space and it's looking at that ship. Um, and then as we progress through season two and season three, we've kind of lost the actually shoot it on set, but we haven't lost the feel, the feel and the, you know, technique of actually like, okay, so we're going, you know, over, under, around the ship. Yeah. We, we still want to feel like real camera that moves. ship is in space and you guys, happen to be on the fly that's checked yeah. it out like, yeah. <laughs> we, we really try not to do anything that 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 a that a at a real live camera couldn't capture in some way even if it's somebody in a fake spaceship following along with our real spaceship yeah because that's the minute you you lose uh, all sense of reality but we could there's no way in hell that this baby behind us we could put it through those kind of contortions and or some of the more stuff we've gotten more ambitious and more complicated in our in our sequences so we'd literally break the model no not, I'm not even being figurative. We'd literally break the model. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I was. But the digital model does have, you know, it does have a real world uh, scale. So it is, you know, hundreds of feet wide, high. You know, so we do have those dimensions. Um, so when it is flying in battle, we're not, you know, it's not like a feather in space. Like we're actually like, okay, this thing is, you know, 80 million tons. How would it actually go through space? Yeah. Like, how does that kind of work? Obviously, like. There's not real fire in space. My NASA friends would tell me that that stuff's not real, but we are still <laughs> trying to make it feel and, you know, have it depict what it might look like as far as we know, what that kind of stuff looks yeah. like now. I know we're working in tight quarters tonight. Um, how much work would it be for you to show us the model, Tom? Uh, if you don't mind us moving this wonderful tripod against the coffee cup, <laughs> it's real easy. So here we are in so Tom's office <laughs> at, uh, at the All Fox right, lot. Well, here's the thing. We, I, I had it. Uh, and you can thank Sam. Yeah. I know, sorry. Thank we're going we're gonna to have to censor uh, that, Tom. Uh, <laughs> family that All right, you know what? Actually, Brooke's to help me lift it up here. Do you want to uh, uh, hang my butt on this thing? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Ooh. We're going to lift. We got to lift straight up. No, no, just going to lift it here. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, there it is. Let's put it over here. Let's put it over here. Ah. We also have a great gym here at yes. Fox. Um, <laughs> All right, so I'm just gonna. Okay, so this, 
This is the this is the model, folks, that uh, that they used at the Orville. Can I I can flop the camera around, can't I? It's not doing that. Hold on, here we go. There we go. I think yeah, it was live. There you oh, go. Here we go. Oh my goodness. <gasps> so this is the actual model, folks, that was uh, that was used to shoot those. Uh, Four hundred thousand dollars worth of fun, kids. Wow. That's awesome. Now, what is it made of? Uh, it's made of resin. Huh? Hopes, dreams, and tears. No, it's a, it's a <laughs> resin. It was partially 3D printed. Uh, I'm supposed to be touching it with the gloves, so I'm going to do that Beautiful. here. Um, but a lot of it is old. Uh, you know, there's a little kit bashing going on here, if you those who know that term. Yeah, get um, us in there, Tom. I want to see details. Here. I want to see details that we'd never see before. Look at that. So you see? Yeah. Is it clear? Is it focused? It's a little hard for me to see. Pretty good. Pretty good. So, but but there's some there's some amazing detail on this. Now, granted, we're making the model way more detailed. You know, as time as as the digital model gets yes. more and more. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of foam here. We're seeing a lot of foam. Wide angle iPhone. My iPhone 11, not making things easy. <laughs> Use one of the other three cameras. <laughs> yeah. Right. So is this the, the model you said that has been dinged and broken? And like, where are those brakes? Because this looks perfect. Looks pristine. Uh, no, the, di the digital model. Oh, <laughs> yes. gotcha. So there is, but I will show. I will show you something. Since you guys are very so, see this right here. Yes. Okay. So because it is three D printed, and because oh it's, yeah, you know, it's a very sensitive thing, and it's been on display before. So this over here, there's actually the it's bent a little bit. So we we keep it in a very special case here to keep it supported. Yeah. Obviously, we can glue this back down and hold it, but you know, it's 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 a, it's a, it's an aerodynamic shape, and it eventually it's it's gonna you know it's gonna deteriorate. So we try mm -hmm. and keep it you know pr pristine as much as possible now because it's more of an artifact of the show than an actual working model. Right, right. But there's amazing, uh, you know, it's it's uh, was the guy? I think it was the guys at ILM that did this for us. I forget. It was Just um, beautiful work. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, for us crazy model people. I mean, I, I've, put, I've posted photos of it before. Yeah, we're getting some close-ups I mean, here, though, we've never seen. This is you know, fantastic. I'd love to show you the bottom, but, you know, the light, you know, obviously you have the working quantum rings and all this yep. other stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's probably hard to see, but there's actually, <laughs> this is so much for my great filming, but there's a, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. Uh, there's a, uh, if you can see, let me get in there. Hold on, sorry. Hang on one sec. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's it's worth it. Hang on, it's very oh, live good. television. Yeah, isn't it fun? Okay, and uh, just Mikey, another example of what you, we couldn't do. The shuttle bay. Oh, oh, that's so cool. Oh, wow. Nice. Do, you, do we need a light with the other phone? Hang on. So so you know this is actually yeah. There we go. Thanks, Brooke. So if you can look here, I'll let you hold the phone and not. All right. So this is if you knew how complicated this was. Okay, now you get a better look at it, right? Wow. See, there's actually a little shuttle in there, which is hard to see, but. Low, you know, lower the camera right a bit for us. Degree, so. Lower the camera a bit for us. We weren't quite seeing it. If we can just see right into the shuttle bay. So I, I am contorting here to get down into yes, the box. Yes. Can you see it? No, I see a lot of foam. <laughs> we're underneath the ship now. Yeah, we're under it. Here, over here. The okay. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, no, oh, 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 wow. It's filled with foam. But it's beautiful, Tom. Oh, they put the foam. But see, the, but see the same painting down here? It's the same, yeah. it's the same yeah. markings as our actual real live stage so yeah just gorgeous yeah the foam is put in there recently just to protect we can pull that out but i kind of don't want to mess with it because I, I like the guys from the actual model company to, yeah. to mess with it so yeah oh that's anyway fantastic. there she is oh no, thank you for showing us i have a Give question you know, about scale that's it you know yeah it's about four feet that's awesome now i have a question mm -hmm. about the design of the ship yeah because i mean when my wife and i've watched the show we wondered why the three fins at the back. Was that anything in particular, or was that just for a cool design? Uh, I think it was partially cool design, but also, you know, Andre Bormanis, he's our uh, resident tech supervisor, and he, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is based in scientific fact. So, um, so, so a lot of so the quantum, the quantum rings and um, quantum energy, all this is based in in in, in future scientific concepts. So. I don't know if the three ring aspect was for strictly for uh, fashion or design, but it was. But the whole idea of the quantum uh, quantum uh, energy is is based in real science. Okay, because I know I think one of the episodes when I believe it was the replacement for Alara, when the new security officer was transitioning, the ship that was beside had only two rings. Yeah, so I, th I mean honestly, you know, we do. It's a little bit of license. You know, like that's what I'm saying is that the three rings, it's really more just because it kind of looked, for lack of a better word, TV sexy. 
Right. Yeah. Fair enough. I just didn't know if it was related to like exploratory so, so, vessel so, versus science <laughs> vessel or something like that. Yeah. So the different the different shapes and rings they kind of they kind of represent the different union classes that we have. Uh, so we have a Leviathan class, we have a science class, we have the cruiser class. So they all have a different look feel. Um, but you kind of want them all to look like something of the union or right. of you know the show, so that we can mm. kind of make sure that when you're in you know, a bajillion ship explosion battle, you know who the good guys are and right. who's not. <laughs> Makes sense. Brooke and Tom, Michael Okuda tweeted earlier this week and said, Star Trek The Next Generation hadn't yet found its legs in season one and two. Now, you just finished season two. You're about to start shooting season three. Do you feel that you've found your legs? I mean... I mean, I, I, I would never want to be so egotistical as to be the person to say that. I, I felt like that the show had found itself in season one. Uh, I think it started with About a Girl and then into Priya and then started really hitting its stride through um, uh, Into the Fold, which is when, uh, you know, Isaac and Claire started, you know, the early part of their relationship. Mm. Uh, I think the second half of season two, we've definitely moved into where I think Seth wanted to be, which is more of a dramedy. Um, you know, I think there's more to come. I think that the beauty of, of, of Seth and the way he works is that he's kind of a showman and he, he believes that, you know, he's in, the, he's in the old Hollywood model. Like you don't, you know, you work on it and it, it evolves like, like the pilot of Seinfeld versus the gestalt of Seinfeld. So mm -hmm. I'm not comparing us to Seinfeld, but I'm saying is, is that you know, it, we're we're always trying to better ourselves. So I think we're more like a tadpole. Like we were yeah. this cute little like one flippered guy, and then we got some legs. <laughs> we got some legs and a flipper, and now we're like full bore toad. Yeah. Mm. And one day we're gonna find our prince, and we're just gonna be the sexiest show you guys have ever seen. Well, that's what we're hoping <laughs> in season three. Well, listen, I fell oh. in I fell in love with the show in season one, but it really started to feel in season two when uh, when the when um, the Kalon attacked, that this was not just what we were all expecting, which was like Seth's vision of that like dramedy um, outer space show, but it really felt like a genuine sci-fi. For our viewers at home, I want to take a look at that clip. Targeting scanners, concentrate your fire. Scanners cannot penetrate their hull. Do eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Pick a spot. USS Spruance. It's Admiral Halsey. Put him on. The fleet's taking a beating. 32 ships disabled or destroyed so far, and we've only taken out six of theirs. The Kalon on... Admiral. Admiral, do you read? This vessel has lost main power. It is retreating. Captain, five Kalon just broke through the line. They're heading for Earth. Pursuit course. Torpedoes, target their maneuvering thrusters.
The Hawking has been destroyed. Taking heavy damage. All breaches on decks E and F. the USS Quimby. The K-Line are less than 50,000 kilometers from Earth. Order all hands to the escape pods. Sir. I'm gonna overload the quantum drive. Captain. Do it. I feel like viewers weren't sure when the show first started what to expect from Seth's sci-fi show mm -hmm. and, and some of us were wondering like is it going to be just a space comedy or a spoof we were right. hearing spoof a lot um, and then it really did evolve into um, this genuine sci-fi show um, did, was there a point along the way that that you folks realized um, internally that hey this is this is really a genuine serious sci-fi well in fairness uh we had access to most of the scripts in season one. Yeah. So we knew where it was going. Okay. And, you know, in, in, and this is not a knock on Fox or anything, but I think everyone, including Seth, and I'm theorizing here for what little we talked about, is that it, it, for him to come out and be taken seriously as a sci-fi vet, I think even he was probably nervous about it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, so he had to sort of see change the audience to get used to him to being able to tell more serious stories. Man's always had it in him. You know, everything is, I mean, this is his vision. This is his baby. But I, I think, you know, I think he, I think, I think a lot of people worried like, well, it has to be family guy in space or they're not going to accept it. Yeah. So probably lean too hard in that direction in terms of promotion and things like that. But like, I always knew that at, when the pilot was around, you know, about a girl was already you know, most of our season, first season was already shot. Same thing with season two when Brooke came along. Like, you know, we knew what, we know where it's going. Yeah. And that also helps us inform how we edit the effects post shoot the whole season. We, we, we know how it ends. Right. Um, so the most frustrating part is waiting, uh, you know, three months, six months, 10 years, whenever long the hell we get this next season out <laughs> for, for the fans to see it. Because yeah. Sometimes they'll ask a question, and we're like, "We can't get what I tell you the answer." Yeah, no, but we can't. I know, you know the answer. Yeah, and I'll be I'll be honest. I personally, when I first started watching the Orville, had a real problem not envisioning Brian as Ed Mercer, like, but just because it's Seth, right? So Brian, the dog from right. from Family Guy, and and so. I, I stuck it out, and it was around episode five that I really realized that hey, this is this is like the genuine article. This is this is great, and now like I, I can't get enough of it. Well, I'm, I'm gonna get uh, he's gonna I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but the boss man can act. He, he doesn't oh, like yeah. when I say it, but I got to stare at him all day. <laughs> he's actually got chops, and you know he is not he is not Brian. <laughs> but yeah. it's in him. I mean, it's part of him, but he's you know. If you've saw the loudest voice and some other things, then you know he's he's got he's got skills and depth and range. So for sure, it just you know he needed some time to he needed some screen time for people to know that. Yeah. So that's all. Well, I think the approach has been fantastic and it certainly worked out well. Oh yeah. Uh, and absolutely, like such a talented guy. I, uh, when when you came in tonight, we were listening to Seth MacFarlane on our Amazon Echo. Um, I'd encourage you to try it. Just say uh, "Shuffle Songs" by Seth MacFarlane and see mm -hmm. what uh, see what it comes out with. Um, now. <laughs> What, one of the uh, comments that I spotted on Twitter as well, uh, just kind of as we're wrapping up, I know your time is valuable tonight, and I really appreciate you taking this we're time. We're good. Don't worry. We're good. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, John Kassar, he said the other day on Twitter, uh, this is uh, executive producer, director of, of yeah. Orville. Um, he said, the audience gets to tell the broadcasters, cable networks, and streaming services what they want by the way they spend their entertainment dollar. So Tom, it raises the question, how can we as fans of the Orville tell the networks what we want? And that's more of the Orville. Like what is that entertainment dollar in today's modern landscape? Uh, well, I'm trying to, because I want to answer this properly. Are you, I mean, like how, how, do you, how do you tell us 
how to spend, I mean, how, how do we get that message across? Well, for, from John's perspective, like there is no free TV. Um, we're actually, we're telling the networks through our spending uh, how, you know, what they should be investing in. How, how well, yeah, we- there, I mean, there is no free TV. If you, you, you know, the God in the days of the antenna, you, you are yeah. paying for charter, you're paying for Hulu live, you're paying for, uh, you know, YouTube uh, live, uh, you know, it, it, you know, in this um, skinny bundling uh, era, you, you, people do speak with their wallets by, by tuning into a show. And it's not even just like viewership, it's online uh, activity, it's, 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 it's fandom, it's, it's conventions, it's also mm-hmm. in our, at least in our case. So yeah. it's, it's being active and passionate is, is a way to let people know that you're into or not into a, a product, for lack of a better word. I mm-hmm. think that's kind of what he was saying. Yeah, I think the and I think because a lot of people are, have been saying is uh, you know, oh we were on free TV, but we really technically weren't. We were just you know we're another pay service, but no TV is free anymore. And they kind of snuck that in under the wire that we all got to pay for the free TV we were supposed to get <laughs> free news. That you know Edward Murrow, if you, you hear that sound, it's Edward Murrow turning his grave right now about how where television is gone. But yeah, you know so everything costs money. When we tune in, is that voting for the Orville? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we when we were, you know, on Fox and we were broadcast like, you know, we still track the viewer numbers um, and that definitely like if we have very high numbers and very high interaction where people are watching it, you know, from start to finish or at least most of it, you know, that tells the networks who, you know, put the money out for us to make content, yeah, okay. you know, hey, yeah, we got to spend money on this because everybody's tuning in for this. It also helps because I think we, you know, we were, we were on Fox, we were around like football, we were on the sports and stuff. So we were like, well, if, you know, if we can get those people to grab on, you know, it's all about placement. It's all about where you're putting everything, where the viewers are at, what time of the day they're at, um, what day of the week they're at. Like all of this is in those very meticulous, um, uh, uh, I don't know it, data it's, it's, sheets. Yeah, and, it's, you know, a, it's a complicated. Everybody's looking at it, but you know, with with uh, streaming, the Game of Thrones did the best, where they were on HBO, and HBO was like, "This is basically paying for our reason to exist." Uh-huh. This app is because people can watch it; they don't have to buy the HBO, you know, cable bundle. They can just buy their six months on right. however many emails they put on there for free, and you know, they. Uh-huh. They're now like, yeah, we have to have this because people are tuning in. They're looking at it. Um, so I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure what the question was, well, but I think what he's trying to say is that by you guys telling us what you want, what you need, like you guys wanted more Orville. We're on Hulu now. We're going to give you more Orville. Uh, if you guys want less Orville, we would have got canceled. We will have a vacation. But you know, yeah. so we want, we want more Orville, and yeah. and well, you talk, you talk well, about well, Hulu. I will, can I, you mind if I add something? Please. So, you know, here's the thing about the television business and, and, and actually the, the film business in general is that because of the way things are now, it's not just live and even live plus three ratings. There's so many other factors that, that uh, come into a, a show's or a, or a franchise's existence. And it, it's changing so fast that even the people that are making it can't always keep up with it. And in and, and terms of technology, in terms of like, you know, where it's being sold, international markets, uh, uh, you know, a mar- uh, 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 marketing in terms of like toys or, or um, you know, uh, I, I mean, parks. theme park. I mean, <laughs> it, it's such a, mo- I mean, t-shirts, basically, t-shirts. This, is, this is the science of making a TV show now. Yeah. And, and so, and we're, because we're not, you know, my dinner with Andre, we're one of those shows, you know, so. Mm-hmm. The math behind it, you know, it's fun. You know, I love interacting with people and they have theories about why the show moved here, moved there, did this. But the, usually the answer is way more mathematical and way more mundane than anyone ever hopes, which is not that exciting, but it's the business of what we do. <laughs> so thinking about Hulu and the change there, what is going to change for the viewers uh, as far as like, uh, I don't mean like, hey, now maybe I need to subscribe to a different service or something like that. But it, what are the changes that are happening at the Orville and, and with the show? Uh, we're bigger. 
<laughs> Bigger, better, everywhere. stronger, faster? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, we're greener. Long, not, I mean, look, Seth has said this and we said it, not having time restriction uh. helps because then the story is as long as, as people want it to be. And that was a big thing. You know, when you, when you, when you cut a story perfectly, you know, luckily, and this is no difference to Fox, they've been amazing to us, but, you know, and they were able to even give us, for one year, give us the 48-10 runtime, right? But, mm. you know, the standard Fox Network show is 40 through 40. I'm saying this because I'm the editor. I know how we do it. You know, yeah. 9 and one has to cram, and they, and they kill themselves up there. They're literally upstairs from us. Uh, they have to jam a lot of story into 40 through 40. Yeah. Now, imagine, like, you've been killing yourself. You're spending millions of dollars to do this, this show, and then you have to cut 17 seconds out just to make this arbitrary time marker. And that 17 seconds could be that one look from that one character uh, that totally changes the tone of a show. Yeah. And now we gotta cut it out so they so they can do a commercial. It's it's a it's an it's an old way of doing things and it and it and it puts storytelling at a disadvantage. I'm not saying it has to go, you know, just roll ad infinitum and then it's just like you're watching like a bunch of dailies that go on forever. But having the freedom to tell the story you want to tell and the time you want to tell it is really big to creatives. Well, it sounds so like that's that's a sorry it sounds like a huge uh, benefit to fans of the show and to the team creating yeah. it as well mm -hmm. all right yeah, i mean and i think we're kind of taking off of you know again the game of thrones the game of thrones hbo model is yeah. like none of those stories would have been told in 45 minutes like yeah you you would have to tune in you know for weeks months and just try to figure out you know how to tell those stories so you know, we, we want to be that cool. We want to be that big. We want to, you know, we want to spend that much money. So, yeah. uh, you know, we, you guys want it to be this great, you know, sci-fi show. And so do we. So what's the best option to do that? You know, go where the champions are at on streaming with, you know, less restrictions, a little extra cash. And <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give awesome. you, you want, you want me to give you a specific example? Because, you know, I've been, we've been pretty good. And thank you to Seth for allowing me and us to put out deleted scenes and things. We yeah, want to yeah. give you a specific example of an episode that, that got banged into it. Yeah, I would love to. Okay. So remember, yeah, Sanctuary, uh, the Jonathan Frakes episode, that was a massive episode, okay? Mm -hmm. There was, but there was some uh, dialogue in, um, you know, in the, in the uh, with F. Murray Abraham in the, in the big, <laughs> my brain's not working, there, the big chamber, you know, the, the, the Planetary Union chamber that, that gave some nuances to the script that had to get cut because even though they were because you could live without them, you mm. know, but it's the little, it's the little details and a couple of jokes here and there that kind of like flesh it out and give it like texture and layers. There was a fight that we were going to originally put online, but it needed some VFX work where, you know, Bordis, you know, he's enraged the, the uh, one of the mock soldiers grabs, grabs one of the kids in the, in the colony. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you, do you remember that at all? Yeah. 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 Okay. And and it's not you now now the way it plays is that he chases him through the forest and knocks him out with the butt of his gun, right? Right. That's what we there's saw. There's a whole two. There's a whole sitting on my abbot right here. There's a whole two minute knockdown drag out fight between him and that guy. That's awesome. Really. Oh, that we would man. just love to have. But so how are the VFX you know, coming on that? <laughs> well, you someone got somebody got to pay for that. So yeah. it's like some things just are some things are just left in the machine. Yeah. Right. But we won't have to make those choices this year. And maybe someday if we have time or Brooks somehow can cajole someone into getting it done, <laughs> we'll get it out there. But it's, you know, it's those it's those painful choices that that we don't necessarily have yeah. to make anymore. Yeah. Right. Now is the plan to release all the episodes at once for the next season or are you phasing them out? And how does that No, we're going to do we're going to do weekly uh, we're going to you know, we're not going to we're not going to we're not going to destroy everyone's life by suddenly dropping it at once. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, just backing up just for, uh, for a real quick sec. When Tom was talking about the toys yeah. and the merchandising, 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 yes. you had a question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in our chat room on Discord, one of the questions is, when are we going to see more Orville merchandising? Like, when is it going to be everywhere? Like Orville Lego. Uh, <laughs> it's literally coming. You know, I, I'm not the marketing guy where I do work with some of the marketing people. And like, in fairness, you know, we're not a, uh, there's a term for it that they call, it's like a, a, a shell, uh, it's like a, a line at Walmart or a, or, a, or, a sh or they have like a, a colloquial term for it. But, you know, we're a little more niche, but there is things coming. As you know, the Eagle Moss stuff is coming that we got Corbin effects doing stuff. Yeah. 
there, there's some there's there's going to be toys and and gadgets and fun that you can buy. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that that speaks again to like you guys tell us what you want. Yeah. You guys were like, we want we want phasers, blazers, and freaking ships. Like now we're like, all right, we need to try to make it. We have the you know yeah. we have really cool trading cards. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, you know we have all kinds of stuff, and even the fans have made really cool stuff that we're like, oh man, like yeah. we need to do that too. Yeah, I have <laughs> some of this in my office, but uh, you know, but. A lot of this is going to roll out between now and, and the premiere, and you know it's awesome. it's it's in production now. Okay. Um, uh, so there is stuff coming, but it, it's never. It, I'm telling you now, there's not a world right now unless you know suddenly we get Marvel size where we're going to have Kenner figures made of everybody. It's just <laughs> that's that's a, that's a very specific model of some very large franchises. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe someday we'll get there, but that that takes a little bit of history and time. Mm. I'm not saying I'm not opposed to it. I would love it, but well, it, I, it takes time to build up to that level. I would love to throw some money at die-cast models oh of my ships. Gosh, yes. um, Johnny well, Avery. Again, I mean, that's Eagle, that's Eagle Moss, and our friends at Corbin are coming out with ships uh, awesome. as well. So you're going to be able to play with little Orvilles at some point. Johnny A. Reed is Johnny A. Reed is hoping to see some krill, uh, maybe some action figures would be pretty cool. Pew 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 oh, pew. John, Johnny can just Johnny can just freaking DM me and ask for that stuff. Isn't the bottom? Of the Hi, Johnny. Squeeze your hand as tight as possible, really flex that forearm. Hey, you know, it's I knew it was eight. Now, we're just about out of time, and I, and I love that you have both taken the time with us this week, and, and we here at the studio appreciate it. I know we, the Orville fandom, really appreciate you taking the time as well. Can you tell us real briefly about what is happening with Season 3 as far as, like, when are you shooting? When can we expect episodes? Is there anything fun that's coming um, that we maybe don't yet know about? I mean, I think a lot of it was revealed at Comic-Con, which was yeah. exciting, is that, you know, everybody's so excited for, you know, bigger, better. Maybe somebody will listen to the pitch about a musical episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, longer episodes, longer episodes, yeah. which is key here. No, yeah. We, yeah, well, we, uh, this is not newsflash. We shoot, in a, you know, we're shooting about a week and a half. So we're, yeah. we're, 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 in the, we're in the trench now. And um, how, how long do you have to shoot? Like, what does that look like? <laughs> Yeah, we, <laughs> well, I can't. I can't really say. It. Let me let me put it this way: we we have we have taken the network model and put it in the side. So we're we're shooting the appropriate amount of days to get these things done. Okay. Okay. So do you shoot the whole? It's side? not battle. It's not. I, I know it's not battle of the bastards, but we're not gonna we're not gonna try and cram. Eleven months a night. Yeah, we're not we're not gonna cram things into t- into eight days. Right. Yeah, okay. So so do you do you shoot the whole season and then it's in your hands, your team's hands to actually put it all together? I mean, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier is that we're we're always multitasking. Yeah. So yeah. you know, we're we're doing, you know, prep stuff so that we can shoot it faster, but you know, again, maybe we'll have a better idea in 6 months and we'll go back and try again, you know, there's not we kind of break the mold of like the formula of like shoot everything and think about it later. Like 
you know, yeah. something could happen with our friends over at NASA where they, you know, get even better pictures of a black hole and we're like, oh, no, yeah, we're we're that that like, yeah. uh, so, you know, our, our pride and joy is to be as up to date as possible, but also be able to multitask so that we can get through as much as we can, because it is such a huge show. Um, and so that we can give it the proper time that it needs to look great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but also be able to, you know, throw in those really snazzy things that come along the way. So we'll, we'll also like, we'll start, I mean, the VFX is up and running now. I mean, I'll, we shoot on the, you know, let's say the 21st. Yeah. Well, there'll be there will, cutting will be happening on the 22nd. So there's already pre-cutting. Hmm. It's wow. you know You're it's the only way to. Get, I mean, yeah. You know the 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 uh, TV and film have started to blend, yeah. um, but the the schedules have not matched. So right. You know we're not quite feature level, but we're trying, and yeah. you know we're effectively shooting four and a half Marvel movies in the time that we have, you know. Yeah. What I mean? So it's oh wow. It's uh, yeah. It's it's a lot of pressure and a lot of intensity. And it's impossible. It really makes it impossible for you to say, okay, we're going to be ready on this date. But do you have some kind of inkling when your your fans will uh, will be able to watch season three? Uh, in discussion. <laughs> in discussion. Hang on, guys. Hang on. Hang on. I love but, you. Uh, honestly, it's, it's, above our, it's above our pay grade. And also, there's just, you know, we're, we're still figuring some stuff out. But We yeah. would love to know, too. We would love to know, too. <laughs> no, as soon as, as, soon as, as soon as damn possible. Right. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Well, I'm you're... really good at pop stick stickle sticks. We'll just like yeah. boop, 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 boop. It's uh, pretty soon it's gonna be in Brooke uh, drawing stuff like once yeah. a week. And, and you're just putting it online. You're just surrounded. You yourselves and and your teams are just perfectionists. And so I expect that uh, that what well, we're going to see is going to be absolutely but we're, amazing. We're, we're, we're not TV by committee here, so it does take some more time to get stuff done. I mean, this is Seth, and yeah. I mean that as the biggest compliment ever he's involved in, in in the process in in a lot of ways so it it takes a little extra time but the care shows on screen and we're yeah. totally cool with it yeah sure does so. love it we waited two years for game of thrones yeah i mean we're not game of thrones we but don't have we'll three dragons it. yeah uh, well, we'll <laughs> pretty <try>. cool <laughs> you already gotta make, we gotta make you already made the co- you already so. made the coffee cup joke i'm just real obsessed <laughs> Well, Brooke Noska and Tom Costantino, thank you so much for joining us from backstage, behind the scenes at the Orville. We appreciate your time so much. Thank you. Of course. Love it. Take care. We have to head over to the uh, newsroom. Sasha, if you're ready. I sure am. Here are the stories we're covering this week in the Category 5.TV newsroom. PayPal has dropped out of the alliance that is trying to launch Facebook's digital currency, Libra. A man has been able to move all four of his paralyzed limbs with a mind-controlled exoskeleton suit. No, we're not early to the April Fool's jokes of 2020. Microsoft is really making a new mobile phone that has two screens and runs Android. And Canada's busiest airport will soon be using artificial intelligence powered technology to detect weapons. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman and here are the top stories we're following this week. PayPal has dropped out of the alliance that is trying to launch Facebook's digital currency Libra. PayPal made the announcement in a statement on Friday but did not specify what had prompted the decision. Libra and its digital wallet Calibra were revealed by Facebook in June. But the cryptocurrency has been criticized by regulators and both France and Germany have pledged to block it from Europe. PayPal said it remains supportive of Libra's aspirations but had chosen to focus on its own core businesses. The firm was one of the original members of the Libra Association, a group of 28 companies and nonprofits helping to develop Libra. Its other members include payments company Visa, ride hailing app Uber, and humanitarian charity Mercy Corps. In response to PayPal's withdrawal, Libra Association said that it was aware that attempts to reconfigure the financial system would be hard. Quote, commitment to that mission is more important to us than anything else, it said in a statement. We're better off knowing about this lack of commitment now, end quote. 
At its unveiling this year, Facebook said that people would be able to make payments with the currency via its own apps as well as on messaging service WhatsApp. Partner firms would also be able to accept Libra for transactions. Facebook said Libra would be independently managed and backed by real assets and that paying with it would be as easy as, as texting. The group of seven advanced economies warned in July that it would not let Libra proceed until all regulatory concerns had been addressed. Central bank chiefs, including the U.S.'s or the UK's Mark Carney have also voiced skepticism and US President Donald Trump has tweeted that he's not a fan of the currency. The Libra Association will hold its first meeting of its governing body, the Libra Council, on the 14th of October. The group said in a tweet that it planned to share updates soon afterwards about, quote, 1,500 entities that have indicated enthusiastic interest to participate, end quote. How interesting. This yeah. is an interesting story because I was just reading today that um, some of the American politicians are telling Visa, if you stay involved, mm. this is going to be highly scrutinized. Oh. Sure. So do you want to continue? And, and so it's there's a lot of scrutiny over Libra. And I mean, I, I know I've said in, in the past, like, I, I think this is not a great idea simply because of the issues Facebook has had. So the, you get them right. attached to it and it's going to immediately open the door to privacy concerns Except or how is it going to be used. And I know it's not just Facebook, yeah, but, but I it. think that plays in, as an undercurrent of fear. If it mm -hmm. wasn't Facebook involved, would people be more open to it? Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing. Like Cryptocurrency backed by so many companies in general, I think, is a, like governments would be uh, hesitant because sure. they, they lose the control over their own economy. That's yeah. true. And that means they lose the control over fair trade and, yep. and other... It, you know, like the, what what would a government do if suddenly they lost all control of the currency? Well, yeah, uh, yeah for sure. That's I mean, true. if you figure, you know, you've got trading on the, the actual stock market of currency, and if suddenly there's a run on, uh, you know, American currency, say, and people are like, you know, I want to invest in Libra instead, and mm -hmm. nationalities are then going with the cryptocurrency, like the U.S. dollar crashes, that impacts the 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 whole economy. Yeah. So there's a whole reason for wanting to keep things from a, a monetary standpoint stable. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? So I, I, do, I do get it. I do get the concern. It's funny because I would, I would think personally because of Facebook's issues, I would have less confidence. But then knowing that Visa is partnered, then that brings up right. the confidence. It's like Visa has this, I have this comfort and in the security of Visa. So I'm like, They've okay, well. They've branded themselves well, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, they really have. They <laughs> They're really, really have. just all about the interest. But, it, <laughs> but what's interesting to me is that I think that because it's Facebook and so many people who aren't as well educated in the privacy issues, mm -hmm. they probably are excited about it because it's Facebook. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, perhaps, yeah. So oh, this is going to be integrated into WhatsApp. Right. So, yeah. hey, that's a great feature, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, there's definitely that, too. Um, I think it's just the natural evolution of, like, this is a technology that now exists. Now, obviously, Libra doesn't. I don't, right. we don't yet know, like, we understand that they're going to be using real commodities in order to, to stabilize the, uh, the currency. Right. But how can a cryptocurrency be stable? That's, like, that's what I'm waiting to find out. Right. And is there going to be no mining of the currency? Like and if yeah. that's the case, how, yeah. like how do you uh, you have to through. acquire it by purchasing it right. with real dollars? Well, just then. like just like regular currency, which is like you're you're doing the exchange. When I when I have U.S. dollars, I've purchased U.S. dollars from here in Canada. Yeah. So we'll see. And and does PayPal bailing out does that really represent any any impact on Libra, or is it just going to carry on and PayPal's just not going to be a part of it because they're really kind of a competing product and and. Uh, mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency doesn't really fall into what they've really established themselves as, which is a fiat-based currency mm -hmm. bank, basically, right. like a, a digital bank. And truly, like time will tell. In five years, PayPal is either going to be kicking themselves for getting out, yeah, or they're going to yeah. be high-fiving each other for getting out. Like, yeah. we don't know, right? Yeah. We yeah. shall see. Yeah. And we'll be here to report on it, folks. <laughs> That's right. That we will. For season 18. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, our teleprompter has stopped working, but luckily I have the news stories loaded on my laptop. So if you'll excuse me, I'll be looking down to read the news. A man has been able to move all four of his paralyzed limbs with a mind-controlled exoskeleton suit. Tybolt, who does not want his surname revealed, was an optician before he fell 15 meters in an incident at a nightclub four years ago. He says, taking his first steps in an experimental exoskeleton suit felt like being the first man on the moon. His movements, particularly walking, are far from perfect and the robo suit is being used in only the lab. But researchers say the approach could one day improve patients' quality of life. Tybalt had surgery to place two implants on the surface of the brain covering the parts of the brain that control movement. 64 electrodes on each of the implants read the brain activity and beam the instructions to a nearby computer. Sophisticated computer software then reads the brain waves and turns them into instructions for controlling the exoskeleton. The injury to his spinal cord left him paralyzed and he spent the next two years in hospital. But in 2017, he took part in the exoskeleton trial with, the Clinitec, with Clinitec and the University of Grenoble. Initially, he practiced using the brain implants to control a virtual character or avatar in a computer game. And then he moved on to walking in the suit. After two years of not walking, he says he'd actually forgotten how to walk and even lost the perception that he was taller than a lot of people in the room. While he quickly took to controlling the exoskeleton's ability to walk, it took a lot longer to learn how to control the arms. He says, quote, it was very difficult because it is a combination of multiple muscles and movements. This is the most impressive thing that I do with the exoskeleton, end quote. Tybalt does need to be attached to a ceiling harness in order to minimize the risk of him falling over in the exos exoskeleton. It means the device is not yet ready to move outside the laboratory. There are also plans to develop finger control to allow Tybalt to pick up and move objects. But the researchers have to be careful how much data they transmit from the brain to the computer. They have 350 milliseconds to go from thought to movement, otherwise the system becomes difficult to control. There is the future potential to read the brain in, a more, de in more detail using more powerful computers and AI to interpret the information from the brain and the team responsible are keen to continue developing the technology. Using the sensors, Tybalt has also used the implant to control a wheelchair. According to the researchers, their motivation is entirely medical in providing mobility to patients who otherwise would be unable to move. Hmm. That is incredible. I know. So, like, let's get this straight. He has, like, sensors in his brain, right. on the surface of his brain, that are reading his, his thoughts to control right. movement. Right. What incredible. What's impressive about that is the fact that they've been able Everything. to... Everything. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things. But the fact that they've been able to isolate the electrical impulses in the brain that signify yeah. those specific movements. Yeah. Like that in and of itself right. is phenomenal. Or is he training his brain to create new ones? Right. Maybe, to control eh? those, yeah. right? I love that they have the avatar first for him to like train on and build <laughs> confidence with because yeah. I can't imagine like controlling a machine with my mind but having my body then at risk, right, yes. at the same time, right? Yeah. So it's good okay. to have that level of That's confidence cool. in the situation. It, it, it is interesting though that it, it can't be done on board. And that maybe it's just the amount of comp computing power that's required you can't build oh. that into the suit well i'm sure that can be done inevitably through technologies like where technology is that look at yeah. single board computers that have right. like um npus on them neural processing units right that can process data at teraflops and they fit like in your pocket so it could be done it's just maybe they you know they got to start yeah that. you got to start yeah. when you're prototyping it's always bigger and oh, of course, yeah, yeah. and 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 certainly the safety harness of being strapped to the ceiling makes sense yes because yeah. like you say you can't imagine what would happen if like he made the wrong thought and it yeah. collapsed on them or something. It's interesting though because I'm like very safety minded in this thought and I think um, it would be really good if they implemented this for wheelchairs 
first. Just like just yeah, by default, like, it works. Right? He's, you, and that seems so much more simple than this. Right. Yeah. Right. Maybe wheelchairs and maybe transfer devices. And cars. Right? Cars. And cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. What is cool about this, though? I mean, and you're talking about putting it maybe in wheelchairs, but I'm thinking all the people that have prosthetic limbs. Mm -hmm. You know to be able to take this mm. technology and go, hey, you know what? So you're missing a part of your arm and a hand. We now have a prosthetic limb. Here's this little implant. You can now control that arm. Oh, like the we're, fact that we're you can getting get there. there. Oh, like yeah. That, but that excites me because uh -huh. you think of the, the limitations that some people have to deal with. It's like, okay, yeah. well, I can't do that. This opens up a whole new world. Oh, yeah. I love it. Like, I am so excited about this project and what it means for giving life back to people who are hampered in some way or another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's great. Cool. I, this is a total good news story. And, and it's not just about that mobility, but just reading, like you say, the wheelchair is, is not moving the body parts. It's moving yeah. uh, like a motorized wheelchair. Yeah. Right. So like the communication can be with a device. It can be with controlling other devices. Who, who knows what they can who, come yeah, up with? Who knows exactly? This mm -hmm. is the world is your oyster when it comes now, to thoughts, ideas. Well, comment I, below. I am wondering from a security standpoint, mm -hmm. like I'm suddenly thinking about the fact that it's transmitting to a computer. <laughs> Could this open up the door to somebody hacking that, so to speak, and taking control of the suit by sending... Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yeah, yourself? But I mean, yeah, like, I'll send your big brothers in there. <laughs> yeah, but I would hope that in something like this, it's not just about the mobility and what they could do, but they're also building in some security oh. protocols mm -hmm. for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, that wasn't covered in the story, but I hope that's the case. Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, it's if this gets to, to the point yeah. of being standalone use, it, it could have an impact. Mm-hmm. We'll see what Still happens over the awesome. next several years with this technology, with the with the research that they're putting into it as That's well. So cool. Now yeah. we've got to take a quick break. The Crypto Report and more of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. In what serves to confirm we are currently living in the end times, Microsoft has made a new mobile phone that has two screens and runs Android. It would appear Microsoft itself is learning that if at first you don't succeed, there's always Linux. They've announced a forthcoming Android Surface Phone Duo at their annual hardware event, among other dual screen Qualcomm and AMD powered goodies. There is a huge catch. You'll have to wait until Christmas 2020 if you want one of your own. Unlike the Samsung Galaxy Fold, Microsoft's attempt at a folding fondle slab pardon me, is quite clearly two screens with a chunky 360 degree hinge in the middle, allowing displays to be positioned however you want, as a small tablet, as a closed up device, half open as a book or fully open as a large flat tablet. Those touch screens are each 5.6 inch units, making an 8.3 inch display when opened up fully. While the separate screens will be scoffed at by owners of Samsung and Huawei's forthcoming foldable devices, which use one large continuous bendable display, the Surface monitors should at least be more durable than the disastrous first attempts by Samsung. Surface enthusiast in chief Panos Panay says the company is, quote, partnering with Google to bring the best of Android, end quote. This comes after Microsoft extracted billions of dollars in patent royalty payments out of Android makers until recently and is about to finally bring down the axe on one of its family of mobile Windows operating systems. And this is Android powered by Linux, the open source kernel that Redmond now apparently loves after earlier declaring it a cancer. Quite a turnaround. Linux kernel creator Linus Torvald said back in 1998, quote, if Microsoft ever does applications for Linux, it means I've won. Well, Linus, you've won. That is awesome. That's yeah. exciting. I mean, well, well done, Linux. Yeah. 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 Um, Just a little bit. <laughs> yes. For the win. Well, it starts to feel like, okay, they... they it was always Windows versus, yeah. and Linux was made out to sound like, oh, only hackers use that. Yeah. Well, 
And, and Linux, Android is based on Linux, so uh, it's basically powered by Linux. A lot of devices are that you don't even realize, your routers and things like that, your phone, your, your tablets, they're all Linux-based. But Microsoft wanted to have Windows-based tablets. Mm -hmm. Now, to be doing Android is pretty cool. I like it. Yeah. Yep. Change, change it up. <laughs> Canada's busiest airport will soon be using artificial intelligence-powered technology to detect weapons. The operator of Toronto's Pearson International Airport says that it has agreed to test the new system developed at an Ivy League American University and marketed by a BC company. Vancouver-based Liberty Defence Holdings Limited says the technology, known as Hexwave, can detect both metallic and non-metallic weapons ranging from guns and knives to explosives. It operates by capturing radar images and then using artificial intelligence to analyze those images for signs of a weapon concealed in bags or under clothing. Liberty says that the technology is not able to recognize facial features and, is therefore, and therefore does not pose a privacy risk, a position experts in the field view with some skepticism. The Greater Toronto Airports Authority, which operates Pearson, says that it will start deploying the technology in the spring of 2020 in a bid to boost security. Dwayne McIntosh, Director of Corporate Safety and Security for the Authority, said, quote, They were trying something that could give us a more definitive look at weapons and plastic explosives that may be coming into airports. When I saw this opportunity, I felt that we had to be part of it, end quote. McIntosh said the exact plans for the pilot project are still underway, but said Hexwave units will be deployed just outside airport terminals in order to pick up on potential threats before they get inside. One of the system's benefits, he said, is that it can be integrated with other airport security features and trigger responses based on what it picks up. Detection of certain weapons, for instance, could automatically trigger doors to lock or sound specific alarms. Pearson Airport is not the only location. The Metro Toronto Convention Center has also signed as a test site. See, I like that last point about locking down doors. Yes. And yeah. Think about schools or something. Mm -hmm. like, like just the idea behind that. As, as frightening as that is and how we don't want that to ever be the case. It's like to be able to lock down based on an, an AI. Now that also has some scary connotations. <laughs> But, okay, mm. I, I would say, like, human-based security, <laughs> like like, human security is always going to be necessary, but also yes. it's kind of easy to pull the wool over somebody's eyes if you know exactly how to socially yeah. interact, right? So to have AI kind of as a backup, not as the only. Okay, yeah, is, maybe that's it. Yeah. Right? That's good, right? To, to, so think of it, that makes me think, okay, so so my immediate thought was, oh, AI being able to lock down all the doors, maybe that's maybe that's dangerous. What if it was instead an alerting system? I, this is yeah. hypothetical. Yeah. But you think about the, the security guard or security person watching 300 monitors in the security room, mm -hmm. and what if they don't catch what's happening on this monitor because they're looking at this monitor? Right. What exactly. if the AI could light it up red and say, burp, 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 something's yeah. going on here? And it could be something, really, that's not e that doesn't even um, incite panic for people. Like, what if the the triggered response is just something that comes across the hall and says you know under construction or you know it, it <laughs> happens all the time up here then right. so like <laughs> but uh, what is it cool about this is that you know for for us here in Canada this is a, a local story for us i mean yeah, i'm yeah. in the metro toronto convention center all the time mm -hmm. i i fly out through pearson often for work and it's like this is kind of neat. I'm excited to actually see this put into play mm -hmm. and to see, do I even notice it? Yeah. Right. I mean, not that I'm going to, you know, try to test it, <laughs> but, but like to see, like walk in and go, oh, yeah, okay, there's that sensor. And, oh, there's that. Like just to see if I can pick up on it or sure. if, does it just become part of everyday life? It's, it's kind of neat. But what it's interesting about it is that it's before you enter the airport. Yes. Yeah. It, because, yeah. I mean, when you get to those security checkpoints, you go through all the steps. But this is kind of like a pre-screening before you even get in there mm -hmm. to protect 
Hmm. Everybody who's checking in for their flights, and that's where the massive load of people are. And it just flights in this this particular scenario, but oh yeah, yeah. there's can thousands I, of people that I, could be in the lobbies all at once. Can, I oh sorry, can you? No, you go ahead. Oh I'll sorry, have, just don't let me lose my thought. I'm okay, th- I wanted to speak to the privacy side of things, where they mm-hmm. said w- there's a little skeptical about the fact that faces aren't recognized or recognizable. I'm wondering what actually you would see on a scan. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. That for me would be interesting. Well, you're not seeing. The AI is the AI interpreting is, data and right. saying, okay, this person, there's some. So my thought is, could this also, not only the positive effect of knowing that, hey, that person is carrying a weapon, but could this also help to prevent um, stereotyping and, um, and racial profiling and, mm-hmm. um, and falsely accusing or falsely stopping somebody. Right. You know based what, on those kinds of things. You know what I bet it would also help too. It would diminish attempts n- with people knowing right, yeah. that the the technology is integrated yeah. in. It might take uh, say somebody was going to target an airport, they're not going to target Pearson because yeah. they know that Pearson has this AI. Mm-hmm. What from a you know, a local perspective on this. I'm also going. Does, does this really need to go into Pearson? Like, is there more going on well, than it's I realize? Proactive, <laughs> like, right? Well, it's I get proactive. that, but it does. Like, let's me, not wait until it, does it make happens. Me wonder, like, okay, so they're piloting this. Mm-hmm. Like, is there a reason for? It? And it, and uh, and it just makes me go. Well, wow, they do a really good job if that's the case, because you never see anything mm. go down at Pearson. Yeah. Yeah. At least the, the amount of oh. times that I've been there. So. To know that this is just an added layer of security that maybe is going to be never used would be great. But if it is going to cut down on stuff, I'm going, wow, well done. Because Mm -hmm. I didn't know now it was an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So that's true. It's it's cool. It's very cool. Sasha, can I jump on to the cryptocurrency report just to let our viewers know kind of where things are standing? Um, As of October 9th, 2019, this is what CoinGecko tells us. Bitcoin, Jeff, is on the rise once again. We're up $325.91 US, which brings us to $8,587.45 per coin. Cool. Facebook Libra still not tra- trading. Uh, Litecoin is at 59.08, gaining just a few bucks. Ethereum is uh, doing pretty well as well at $191.42, up from 177 last week. Monero is uh, holding steady at 55.82. And Scala, one of the small little uh, micro coins, is losing again just a little bit at 0.32 ten thousandths of a cent. Turtle coin, on the other hand, is uh, gaining the same amount almost uh, at 0.26 ten thousandths of a cent. Is Scala the one that kept changing its name? Yeah, it was Stellite and then it was Torque and then right. it became Scala. So. so it's still on the downward yeah. trajectory. Like, yeah. It makes me wonder if this is really as a result of switching those names. Oh, I'm sure. Like if people have lost people Stop trading in it. That's pro- part Pro- of the problem. Probably. Right? You lose confidence in a coin that doesn't have stability. One of the things, uh, uh, looking at micro coins, Turtle Coin has been consistent. Yes. And it's been stable. And because of that, it's. Oh, and, it, and their logo is a turtle shell. Oh, it's <laughs> Which so is adorable. pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the win. Um, but, but. R- really, I mean, that gives you confidence in the microcoin and being a microcoin. There's not, there's no risk. Basically, it's yeah. not, not like you're going to buy 10 billion of them, but y- you can mine them because they're so plentiful, and you can get it on consumer hardware still, and and that's still a possibility. But the thing to remember about cryptocurrency is that the market is always open and it's always changing. It's mm-hmm. very volatile, and I mean, like from right now at this very moment to 10 minutes from now, and even overnight, it's going to change completely and flip sure. on its head. So you really have to. To make sure that you're only investing and spending um, what you can afford to lose because you quite frankly are very possibly going to lose it it's up and down yep. all the time but hey if you get gains then that's that's uh, a powerful thing but also there's uh, flooding or holding mm-hmm. and and investing in the future and and holding that and trusting that hey Bitcoin's gonna be worth more one day mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think that's what we're going to see as soon as Libra starts trading as well. That's true. You know, big investments com- coming into Libra, which is going to then very quickly boost the uh, the Libra economy and cause it to go up in value as well. So we'll see what happens. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, just keep that in mind. 
big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And for more free content, be sure to check out our website. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm in charge of all of the tech around here. Sorry about that teleprompter, <laughs> but you did all right, so hey, well thanks. done. Yeah. And I'm Jeff Weston, and I just stand here. <laughs> He's here for the comic effect. I read manuals. <laughs> I read the instructions. <laughs> we do have to take a really quick break, folks. Stick around. Welcome back, everybody. That's all the time that we have. Thank you again to our guests from the Orville this week. Uh, and next week, we're going to be doing some, some maker stuff. We're going to be Excellent. building, assembling, creating our very own thermal imaging scanner using consumer available Ooh. components. You don't want to miss out on that. Now, we're going to be using it to be able to create um, uh, like a thermal visual of our single board computer so that we can see where the heat is and, and see how uh, oh, cool. how our cooling systems are working. Uh, we're going to actually be assembling that and, and building that next week, so you don't want to miss out on that. But it's all the time that we have this week. Hey, please do join us on Patreon for some added bonuses. They call them perks. You can go to uh, patreon.com slash category5. Your newsroom is now on yeah. uh, Patreon as well. Patreon.com slash newsroom. I have uh, my own Patreon. Yeah. So if you want to support her news show, then uh, then head over there as well. And uh, we greatly appreciate your support. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. We'll talk to you again next week. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thank you.